everybody, we're throwing a Tony party for all the members of the Producers Perspective Pro. So this is a great month to join. Check out the theproducersperspectivepro.com, get an invite, and join us on June 11th to see who wins the big prize. Now on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my once a month sit down with a mover and shaker on Broadway. I am Ken Davenport. This is the Producer's Perspective podcast. I'm super excited to have as my guest today someone that I've watched climb up through the ranks to become one of the youngest lead producers on Broadway. Please welcome to the podcast, Ms. Eva Price. Welcome, Eva. Hi, Ken. Happy to be here. Long time fan. <laughs> First time podcasting. I love it. Listen, she can be a voiceover artist, too. Eva has had about 20 producing credits on her IVDB page on everything from The Addams Family to On Your Feet to Dear Evan Hansen. She's also taken the lead on shows like Colin Quinn's Long Story Short, Peter and the Starcatcher, A Time to Kill, Kathy Griffin Wants a Tony, The Temptations, The Four Tops, and a ton more. She's also been one of the most passionate and prolific off-Broadway producers we have behind such terrific shows as The Lion, Small Mouth Sounds, I have that author on the podcast, Found, and many, many more. She has a GM department, she books tours of her own, she does it all, and she's just getting started. So, let's talk about how you did get started. What, what was your first experience in the theater? My first experience, besides coming to your office and making you talk to me over coffee, was a off-Broadway production called Joy at the Actors Playhouse, which you were very kind to come to, I do remember. And that came out of a friend who had optioned the rights and didn't really know what to do with them. And I was working in the news business at the time and was really passionate about Broadway, but had no idea how to do it, didn't know anything about working in the theater, and volunteered my time to help him because I was bored being in the news business. So in the news business, what, what specifically were you doing? I was an assignment editor for ABC News and a coordinating producer for all of their political coverage. And I used to host back when TV became like on the internet. Do you remember those days? When you like watched moving video on the internet? So I hosted a show about Broadway called The Mix. And I was uh, doing kind of everything, but really dispassionate and lacking creativity and wanting that for my life. And did you grow up on the theater? Did you Were you just a fan of it and then said, well, I'm not going to have a career in it, so I'll go into the news? Yeah, I was an actor. I pretended to direct things. I produced a cabaret senior year of high school where my pianist almost couldn't make it to opening night. And I had to go to her parents' house and beg to let her out of her homework assignment. It was a it was a whole thing, even at seventeen. Pretended to direct it. I see a show the other day where the director pretended to direct it. Actually, amazing. So you know, it's funny because you you brought it up. We did have a copy. I'll never forget it. I know exactly where it was. The Starbucks up by Columbus Circle up there. And I was so taken by your passion for wanting to produce Joy, which I did go see because I was like, I got to go see this because this woman is going to do some things. So that was just a friend of yours show? Yeah, Ben Rimmelauer, who now has like patty issues and I think he'd be a great addition to the podcast actually. He's a really funny theater maker and theater writer. That's very true. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Yeah. We'll reach out to him right after this. <laughs> right after this. Great. So that led to what no, actually let me ask you this question, it may be a difficult question. How did that show do? Terrible. Terrible. But it lasted six weeks, and not the four that I think it probably should have lasted. <laughs> but that's okay, because if I had succeeded my first time out, I don't think I would have learned nearly enough. And I think the best thing about starting a career and starting something new that's this challenging as in producing theater is to fail first and pick yourself up and keep going and learn from those mistakes. So how did you pick yourself up and not just run away and back to the news, frankly, which is where I think most of the people would have run to? Yeah, I um, had a lot and lot and lot of coffee dates, actually, following that. Um, I instinctually felt that I was good at it, even though practically uh, I was not because I didn't succeed. But I felt that the things that I thought about while it was failing and the decisions I made while it was failing and the impulses that I had about the theater industry, I, I thought were good ones. So 
I literally wore, uh, I lived in Brooklyn back then, I remember this so clearly, and there was free Wi-Fi at the COSI up on 49, and this was like 2006, and I would literally like put my laptop in my backpack every day, and I'd go up to that COSI, and I'd send emails, and I'd do research, and I'd meet people for coffee dates at that COSI, and then I'd go back to Brooklyn at night, and eventually I was like figuring out that you needed to raise money for stuff, and you needed to option shows and you needed to create a revenue stream for your producing office that was more than just waiting for the moment for your royalties to come in. And I, by sort of choice, by mistake, by whatever we want to call it, I taught myself how to be a producer while also growing a general management business. So what was the first thing you did after Joy? The first thing I did after Joy was a tour of the Great American Trailer Park Musical. Oh yeah, it came out of NIMP. So that ran off Broadway. I raised a little bit of money for that, and then that closed as well. But I, I, I that was a, very much more a hobby. You know, I, I was not an active producer on it, um, but I liked it, so I, I helped raise some money. And I realized that the show itself was so good and so funny, but probably just cost too much for commercial off Broadway at that time. So uh, with another partner, we optioned the rights to tour it. We worked with a booking agent at the time, and we created. What I think at that time was a production budget that was about one-tenth of the off-Broadway budget and a weekly nut that was about one-third of the off-Broadway running budget. And we were able to tour it for 18 weeks and took it to the Edinburgh Fringe and really breathed a lot of life into its licensing. And that's sort of how I cut my teeth on producing and general managing for tours. You, you cut your teeth on producing a general managing tour by producing a general managing tour. Correct, correct. So what made you think, like, oh, I can do this. I'll figure it out. Yeah, it was a lot of naivete, like, truly. Like, if I actually knew how hard it was going to be ahead of time, there's just no way I would have done it, either produced or general managed in the end. But it was, I was so, and being young is, like, really helpful because you're so cocky and stupid <laughs> and unafraid. And 28 years old, 29 years old, and I thought, okay, I'll, you know, uh, how hard could this be? This, this, the C, I can teach myself this. There's, there's some, you know, there's the CTI class I took, and that prepared me. And I'll just take some more people for coffee and ask more questions. And you know, and I brought people in to work with me, people who had company managed, and people who worked in GM offices, and I just asked them really everything and ask them to help me and I paid them money and I eventually figured it out. I know it sounds insane. No, it sounds great. And I love the the comments about being young. I always use the analogy like when I was went skiing when I was eighteen, I just pointed myself down the hill and went. Right. Like nowadays if you put me on a ski slope, I'd be like, Oh my god, I'm gonna break a leg, I'm gonna break a leg. Uh, there is something to getting out there and just doing it. You mentioned raise, raising some money back then. How did you do it then? Where did you start with that? A lot of friends of friends. So I am from Boston, which meant I knew very few people and didn't have family members here in New York. But I was really good at cold calling and networking my way into situations. So it began actually with a friend told me about an investor friend that he knew, and he gave me the phone number. And that was the first call I ever made, actually, was to that investor who ended up becoming a longtime business associate of mine. It was kind of, again, amazing. Cold call. Cold call. Just literally phone, not even email. Correct. Because it was 2000 and whatever. I, uh, I heard you had invested in the producers. This is what I said. At that point, I thought he had therefore made a million. I, I thought he made millions of dollars because he invested in the producers. Turned out he invested ten grand. <laughs> but I remember I said, I heard you invest in the producers. That's great. I think that there's a lot more productions like that in your future. I'd like to be a part of them with you. Can we meet? And I would just meet people and then cold call and then meet people and then cold call and, and one thing would lead to the other. I, again, it had everything to do with the fact that I was too young to know that that's an insane way to go about doing business. But obviously work. And so when you got people to say yes to you, why do you think, including that guy that ended up being a long-term business associate, as you look back, why do you think they said yes? Like what about your pitch that you were saying or you, you were you were doing made them go, oh, yeah, I'm going to invest with this person over the long haul. Yeah. I think because I was 
truly, truly passionate and frankly, probably emotionally, authentically true in my pitch. I really believe that this, every time I have put on a show, I truly believed in that moment. Maybe things change six months later, but I truly believed in that moment that the show deserved a life. I believe that the economic strategy of the show made sense for investor return. I believed that the artists involved in the show had something important to say and deserved the platform of Broadway or off-Broadway or tour. And I think that authenticity really got me a long way. So flash forward a bit, you now lead produce, of course, and then you partner with folks as well. What makes you decide, and same thing, same thing that I do, right? So I lead produce, but also uh, partner and co-produce. What makes you decide a, a show to co-produce? Two to three things, I think. I choose to co-produce shows in which if they existed and I wasn't a part of them in some way, I would feel sad. That's one reason. So maybe I'm not the lead producer, but I see it happening, and to not be a part of it doesn't feel like the right choice. Sometimes I choose to co-produce a show because the artists involved are people that I want to support, and I believe in so wholeheartedly, and perhaps we even have a show that I'm developing with them in which I'm going to lead produce it one day, and I just want to be on their team. Perhaps it's a show in which the lead producer on it is someone that I want to support, for whatever reason, they've been supportive of me. I believe in who they are and what they stand for and the reason they're producing that show. I just I want to support their vision. And then because it's a great investment and I want my investors to have a great experience and I want to have a great experience. I wrote a blog a couple of years ago in response to like a teenager who wrote in saying, I want to know what a producer does. So I like asked 100 producers what a producer does and I got 100 different answers. What do you think in one sentence a producer's responsibility is? A producer's responsibility is to do everything he or she can do to see the best outcome for that show and for that show's investors. So that would include everything relating to its artistic success, everything relating to its business success, everything relating to the legacy that that show needs to leave for itself. You know, Stone Unturned, no email unreturned, no phone call ignored. It's beginning your day and ending your day, knowing that you did everything you can to make that show successful. That's a producer's job. Terrific answer. And you describe a lot of things there, of course. The producer's job is everything. And from marketing to raising money, there's all sorts of things that we have to do, right? What do you think is the most important thing a producer in 2017 has to do? most important skill, if you could only choose one of the many skills that you have, which one would you say, this is the one I'm taking down with the show? Yeah, I I think the most important skill a producer 2017 has to have is to understand the world they're in. I think if you're producing a show or you're behaving in a way in how you're producing a show that is not cognizant of the world around you, then you're, you're failing. You're failing your show and you're failing the audience and you're failing your artists and you're failing your investors. And what does that mean? I think that means everything from the topic has to resonate and be relevant for 2017 and the world that we're in right now. It has to matter. It has to exist. There has to be a reason for it. But you also have to exist in light of 2017. And that means be smart about how you market it. Be smart about the message you use to talk about it. Be smart about the mechanisms in which you sell your show, from how you price it to what sort of platforms your your ticketing is on to how you utilize social media and the digital sphere to be relevant. I think people who choose to ignore... I, I'm, I'm, I'm really harping on the fact that you asked about 2017 because I think people who ignore the time and the place that they're living in while producing is so foolish. They're so connected. It's an entertainment option in the midst of 3,064 entertainment options that we Americans have each day, from Netflix to CISO to YouTube to the Apple Watch. There's just so much to consume. So if you're not going to be cognizant about the world you're in, in both the art itself and the narrative you're creating to sell your art, go home. I'm sorry to say. I get so passionate about this because I watch people make choices and I watch them spend $17 million on their productions or I watch them 
figure out ways of how to message, and they're just ignoring the world that they're in, and it breaks my heart. There are now 3,065 options for us, by the way, in, in that time that uh, not something else just came out. <laughs> Is there anything that, whether it's when you were having coffee with me or thinking about leaving the news, what's the biggest surprise to you about now that you are sitting in a big chair and producing shows? Like, well, I never... I never thought I'd be doing this, or that this is what it would be like, good or bad. I think the audience is what surprises me. Who they are, how supportive they are. And I don't just mean the people sitting in the theater at night. I think I mean the the fans on BroadwayWorld.com and the folks lining up the stage door and the people consuming theater news and, and theater information. I'm I'm surprised how vast and diverse and intelligent and sort of heartful the the theater audience is. I, I, I don't think I realized it when I first started off. I just thought it was a bunch of, you know, ladies over fifty five who had blue hair, but actually don't have blue hair. I still don't understand where that where it came from. Did you find it hard to quote unquote break into the business? Yeah. Yeah. Some of that was self imposed challenges like I'm young and I'm female and I'm not rich and so I should just sort of wait my turn or it's not time for me to speak up or I don't deserve that like that was that I had a lot of that in, in the first several years but I I had some great mentors who gave me opportunity all men interestingly enough and a few women as I started coming coming up more I started meeting more female producers who've been lovely have been partners of mine and have been friends, but you know, I, I always look back and I think about my first real two mentors in the theater business, and those were two men my father's age who just believed in me and cared about what I had to say, and that was really helpful and really important, and really confidence building. Do you think it is more challenging to be a woman producer on Broadway in 2017? I do, Ken. I really do. And why? Tell me. There's a bit of chauvinism still that exists on Broadway. I don't know why, and I don't know where it comes from, and I can't point a finger at it or blame, but it just exists, and that could be because it's a largely male industry. Every major position at every major theater chain is male. It just happens to be that way. Many of the most sought-after directors and writers tend to be male, choreographers as well, so the talent pool is like that. Many of the agents are, are male. So, and these are friends, and these are supportive males, and these are lovely people, but it creates an imbalance that is hard to ignore, that exists. There are, there are golfing opportunities for those men when they get together, and there's social opportunities that exist that, as a woman, you're just not part of. And when there's an imbalance, like just a flat-out, no, to no one's fault, but gender imbalance... You can't help but perceiving that and feeling less because of that. What do we do to counteract that? We kill all the men, Ken. No, I love men. I do. I really do. I think we need to find ways to be more supportive for younger women coming into the industry, whether that's helping them financially through stipends and paid internships and opportunities. I think if we can encourage women that there's a place for you here as a producer and as all of those creative jobs that I mentioned, that the industry wants those voices, the industry is here to support those voices, the industry is encouraging the expansion of those voices, then I think that's one thing we can do. I, I think people are scared of Broadway in general, working on Broadway, because of, because of its challenges, because it's so difficult, because of its one in five success rate. And, you know... I think it takes a lot of confidence to come into a world that's hard to come into anyway. And then to look around and see your gender is sort of not marginalized, but not as prominent. That's hard. That's hard. Well, you're a terrific role model for young women out there wanting to do this because you, as you said, I wasn't rich. I didn't know anybody. I was working in the news and look what you managed to achieve. And what I really like about what you've done is you found a little niche in doing some things on Broadway, some concerts and special events. Tell me about how that happened and, and came up for you. Yeah, so when I left the news business, I told my parents on Thanksgiving that I was going to 
go and become a Broadway producer. I'll never forget this. And my mother just sort of looked at me and was like, I don't understand how you will make money. <laughs> and I said, Mom, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing. And that's all you got to worry about. You know, 10 years later, I have not figured out how to make a killing, but I have figured out how to make a living, which is actually fine. That is an actual, apparently, you can, you can live in New York by just being normal. <laughs> and I'm, I'm fine with that and grateful for that. And the way I did that was I looked at Broadway as a place I would always work in a community I would be a part of, find ways to either reproduce, co-produce, or produce a special event or concert once a year or more. But I knew that there was a beyond Broadway that was fruitful and creating great work and was and was a home for me also. So I decided, you know, pretty early after that Great American Philadelphia Musical Experience that I would always have a touring business going on simultaneous to my Broadway business, whether that was small shows or big shows. So I always created a pipeline of touring. Um, and I brought in staff and created relationships with booking agents so that those, which went out on guarantees and therefore could guarantee revenue each year, I made sure that my pipeline always was filled with those. What I would also do, because I am fortunate enough to have a really nice relationship with Live Nation Entertainment, is I would always be in process with them to produce uh, concerts on Broadway, you know, limited engagements, which also helped generate revenue. Because I enjoyed Off-Broadway as a place to create artful shows and, and grow talent, I figured out that there's a world of regional theater out there that wants to license and do hybrid touring of hit Off-Broadway shows. So I created a circuit with a few different artists to always bring shows to the various lords and presenting houses around the country. So I, I feel like that became kind of an important way to be saying something about the world through artistic endeavors like Small Mouth Sounds and The Lion. It allowed me to also generate revenue and give shows longer and greater lives than if they only happen once in New York. Yeah, you actually can't make a killing unless you figure out how to make a living. That's the tricky thing. Like, I think no one knows how to make a killing. It just happens. You're around long enough. You're in the right place at the right time, and it happens. But you've managed to figure out a way to be around, so when the opportunity comes, you will kill it. Yeah. Tell me about Off-Broadway and what you think about its current state right now. Oh, my God. How many times have you asked that question to people? You know, not, not many, because usually people will be like, it's the worst place on earth to be, and you've managed to be there many, many times and managed to figure out some way to make it work, whether that's because you're touring it or not. I'm curious just about, is it dying? Is it dead? If it was a patient in a hospital, what floor would it be on? It would be going back and forth between the ICU and the rehab facility. <laughs> Good answer. My opinion of Off-Broadway is that it has become the most exciting breeding ground for new artists. And I'm not going to forget that, and I'm not going to turn my back on the sphere of Off-Broadway, the space, the Off-Broadway space, because it's hard to recoup. I want to be doing exciting work and I want to be supporting new artists and telling new different stories, then I have to keep I have to keep an arm's length approach to it. I have to be there. And I don't have to be there every season. I don't have to be there all the time, but I have to be there. I have to I have to support it and I have to like it. To answer your question, what do I think of it? I think it's how every producer learns how to be a producer unless they just get lucky, right? So if you're going to start off being a producer and you're likely going to fail anyway, I say fail where the stakes are so much lower. I say fail at $300,000 instead of $3 million or $15 million. And I produce there now. I produce there because I think that these shows need to have a life. And the risk of putting it up off Broadway to have that life makes so much more sense than the risk of putting it on Broadway. And so far, so good. I mean, the, the things that I have done there have been things that have found a life outside of their off Broadway run. I think nonprofit off Broadway is, is certainly where it's at these days. We've got some really exciting things starting there. 
And if it wasn't for nonprofit off Broadway, I think Broadway would not be as exciting or successful as it is in some cases. And so I, I, I don't want it to go anywhere. I want to keep supporting it and figuring out how to fix it. But I think turning your back on it is not the way to help it. Do you have to use a different strategy to raise money for off Broadway than you do for Broadway? Yeah, you have, you have to have the long strategy, the long view strategy. And a lot of savvy producers and investors who do produce off-Broadway or invest off-Broadway actually really understand that. They understand that something that doesn't necessarily recoup off-Broadway but becomes a hit and therefore is licensed and done all over the country and all over the world will likely get them to recoupment faster than, say, something on Broadway that has a chance of maybe recouping 60% on Broadway and then going into licensing. I think your approach to raising money off Broadway has to be a artistic approach with a lower risk promise, meaning you have to come first at it with we're supporting artists and we're supporting an art form and our downside is really low. Where on Broadway, I think your approach to investors and co-producers is here's the business model, here's why it makes sense, here's why I'm doing it, here's why I think you should do it, here's the potential for it, but you're constantly going back to that 15-week recruitment schedule or that one-year recruitment schedule for the musical, and I think with Off-Broadway, you're you're really talking very strongly about what it could do Off-Broadway, but what it could do on tour and what it could do in licensing. And what it could do if it became a film or if it became a TV series or if it became a podcast. I mean, I think those are the things that that are often happening off Broadway. I think I just read today that Jordan Harrison's Marjorie Prime is getting distribution. I mean, this is happening. You know, Roundabout is churning. Uh, and these are coming from the nonprofits, largely. But, you know, they're churning out these great plays by these great writers. And they're having these great lives after. These plays are having great lives after. And I think the producers that are supporting them are actually getting monetary return. If a young producer, new producer, never produced before, came to you and said, I have $500,000, I have an opportunity to be a co-producer on Mamma Mia 2, starring Hugh Jackman, or I could take the same $500,000 and produce a new musical off-Broadway and be the lead producer on it, which would you tell them to do? Oh, God. (laughs) I would... I would ask them a whole boat of questions before I gave them any advice. I'd want to ask them what their goals are. I want to ask them where they see themselves in five years. I want to ask them what do they want their experience to be like at this point in their life with this 500000 And then I'd have to give advice because the answer changes. If if this 500000 was just about recouping and showing investor return, then the Jackman show is a pretty good choice. But if that 500000 is creating a business model and a name for themselves and a learning experience that is then going to provide years and years of opportunity and potential revenue and relationships, I might advise them that. Do you think it's easier to get into Broadway producing today than it was when you got started? More challenging for the producers today? I don't think it was very easy when I got started either. So I wouldn't say that it's more challenging today than it was then. I do think that the world has changed in that there's more producers on more shows now than there ever have been before, for all the reasons that are obvious, to spread risk out, to create communities around your shows, to get the show capitalized to begin with, just need a lot of help. And I think people are more open because they need more producers on their shows. I think people are more open to more producers than than maybe when I first started out. But I, I wouldn't say that the recruitment rate has gotten better or that investors are are, are more prevalent. I, I think it's I think it's just as hard. I think thirty years ago it might have been easier than it cost, you know, an eighth of what it costs now to put a show up. But I think the last sort of 15, 20 years, my sense, you know, I've all been producing for about 10, 11 years, but my, my sense is that for the last 10 to 15 years, 20 years, it's been tough since post 9 11. I think it's been tough. What's your advice for the young person out there that wants, or old person out there that just wants to get into the game? What would you tell them to do first? I tell them to align themselves with a creative team that they 
feel really passionate about and feel that their show is in very good hands with. I would tell them to make the right choices for the right reasons at the right time. I would tell them to think long and hard about their general manager, advice that we were all given when we first started. And I would tell them to go for it. All right, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you, knocks on your office door and says, you've had such a fantastic rise to where you are today. And you're such a terrific role model to young producers and young women producers all over. And I want to thank you for all the work you've done so far by granting you one wish. What's the one thing that gets you so upset, could have you turn this table over, screaming obscenities about Broadway that you'd ask this genie to wish away? To Can I meditate? I won't be flipping desks. That's even better. So what would make you take the meditation and throw it out the window? What's the one thing I want to change about the business? Yeah. Is that really your question? The, the question really is what's the one thing that pisses you off so much about this business that you want to change? The thing that makes you angry. How much time do I have left? As much as you want. I think that the general vultureness of our business, the schadenfreude, nature of our business, which is prevalent and so obvious and so there, even among friends, I think it's really, really bad for us. And I don't think there's actually a lot of ways around it, frankly, because of the limited real estate that exists for the shows to be in, i.e. our number of theaters isn't vastly changing anytime soon. I think because there's a limited amount of press coverage that a show that any Broadway show can get because the arts pages are disappearing and because there's so much else to cover in the world besides theater. I think because there's a limited amount of top talent. I think the scarcity of things that we're facing in the theater industry causes our vultureness and our shine and Florida to exist. So, like I said, I don't think there's a way to stop it, but I do think it's really bad, and I wish that we could be just a little more supportive and a little more encouraging, because I think that, like, passion and that positivity and that karmic loop that we're all in could actually really help us. But until the world changes a bit more, I, I, I see us continuing to struggle and compete, and I don't know, I'm a capitalist as well, and at the same time, competition breeds really healthy things too, so... Maybe I'm sitting here contradicting myself. <laughs> so maybe I just want more theaters. Good answer. We'll all meditate on that. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having coffee with me however many years ago. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time. Don't forget, join the Producers Perspective Pro.com this month and get an invite to our Tony party, the Producers Perspective Pro.com. I'm going to be a producer.